Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm John Fraser, the Dean of the Faculty of Medical and Health Sciences, and it's a very great pleasure to have you here tonight for our fifth inaugural uh, lecture in a series of seven. Uh, it's a very wet, wintry night, so it's a pleasure to see so many of you here. Uh, before we start the lecture for tonight, I'd just like to introduce uh, uh, the uh, inaugural lectures. They are, in fact, a very old tradition in academia. Uh, they date back many hundreds of years. Uh, they are the highlight of our academic career, of, of our academic calendar, and uh, they are uh, one of the more enjoyable events uh, that we uh, provide both to our colleagues and also to the public. So as I said, uh, inaugural lectures are a tradition that date back to medieval times. Uh, in those days, universities were uh, very small. They were typically just a collection of professors. They were typically recruited into an elite brotherhood that supported and protected each other. Uh, they lived in cloistered surroundings, uh, well away from the real world. They answered only to themselves and to their esoteric subjects, uh, but still expected to be paid handsomely for the fact that they were smarter than everybody else. Uh, I'll leave it to you to decide whether you think things have changed too much since those <laughs> days. All joking aside, uh, inaugural lectures are a way in which the university announces uh, its new professors. They are a means of showcasing our most eminent staff, a celebration of event that represents, for many, the pinnacle of one's academic career. Elevation to the title of professor is not taken lightly. Uh, the process of selection is long, involved and requires intense scrutiny by international peers who confirm to the university that the appointee meets the international level of uh, eminence or eminent expert in their field. Thus giving them a license to say anything they like <coughs> in their chosen subject with the sure knowledge that people will believe what they say. Inaugural lectures are also a wonderful opportunity for family and friends, colleagues to gather to celebrate this occasion and to learn about the journey that the individual has been on. The academic success, the milestones, the decisions, the failures, the heartbreaks, but most importantly, the mentors who have helped them along the way. Tonight, it's my very great pleasure to introduce uh, tonight's lecturer, Professor Kristen Print, uh, and I'll ask uh, the uh, head of the School of Medical Sciences, Professor Paul Donaldson, to provide some introductory remarks. Paul. Good evening, everybody. And it's, uh, as Professor Prince, head of school, it's my pleasure to introduce Chris and to uh, summarise some of the many achievements that have seen him um, promoted to the rank of professor. As pointed out by the Dean, promotion to professor is an involved process in which the candidate has to have shown international distinction and outstanding leadership in the domains of research, teaching and service. In this regard, Chris is more than a worthy recipient of the title. Chris's academic journey to the rank of professor started with his graduation from the Auckland Medical School in 1989. <laughs> he then worked as a health surgeon in Dunedin, before he undertook, uh, where he undertook asthma research, as probably as one of his first tastes of research, before returning back up north to embark on a PhD in molecular immunology at the University of Auckland. Chris's research interests then took him to the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne for four years where he studied the mechanisms of programmed cell death or apoptosis. From Melbourne, Chris moved to Cambridge University in the UK where as a fellow of St Edmunds College he researched endothelial cell and reproductive genomics. While as a fellow of Cambridge College, he also gained valuable experience in many aspects of tertiary education, including selecting high quality postgraduate students, investing in their um, pastoral care, the art of communication of science, mentorship and organisational leadership. As well as this, he seemed to find enough time in the UK to actually co-found a bioinformatics biotechnology company which was named Gene Networks International, which was successfully listed on the Tokyo Stock Exchange in 2007. So on the basis of all these achievements, Chris was recruited back to the University of Auckland in 2005, 
as an Associate Professor of Pathology, and since this time he has led a cross-disciplinary research team of clinicians, biologists, statisticians, mathematicians, in the effort to better understand uh, cancer pathology. This, during this period, the combined effort of this team has resulted in some 58 publications, 32 funded research projects, which have amassed a total of $12 million in research funds. Quite an achievement. Now, as a university academic, a large amount of Chris's time has, of course, been invested in education. These education processes have, the, have included the full um, spectrum of curriculum development, course coordination, designing innovative scenario-based teaching, and this effort has resulted in Chris being awarded a number of um, student teaching awards. He has also led a, a new web-based teaching initiative, <coughs> new forms of assessment, chaired program reviews, and acted as a member of the 11-person team to revise the entire medical teaching program, which has just undergone accreditation. At the postgraduate level, Chris has obtained funding from Rotary Clubs, uh, the Foundation of Research and Technology, and the Breast Cancer uh, Research Trust to set up an, an annual internship which allows clinicians to spend time learning about genomics and bioinformatics in uh, Chris's laboratory in an academic setting. Because of Chris's deep interest in ensuring ethical use of genomic data in medicine and research, and ensuring that it benefits all groups in New Zealand, Chris has found himself involved in a number of leadership roles, both within and outside the university. He is the director of the university's Bioinformatics Institute, the president of the New Zealand Society for Oncology. I'm glad I wrote this down, it's a long list. <laughs> Chair of the advisory committee of the Auckland Regional Tissue Bank, a member of the University of Auckland's e-research advisory board, a member of the Council of the Auckland Museum Institute, and the advisory board for the University Initiative of Complex Biological Systems. Quite a list. On top of this, since returning to Auckland, Chris has organised 11 international conferences that were actually held in New Zealand, bringing overseas researchers to New Zealand to gain those networks. And this has resulted in some 75 invited talks and media interviews. Most recently, he's been recognised for his service to, service to cancer research and education by an Auckland Rotary Club, Paul Harris Award. So, in closing, as I'm sure you will agree, this is an impressive list of achievements across all the three pillars of academic life, research, teaching and service, with a major characteristic of this effort being the leadership demonstrated by Chris in all of these three domains. To me, the thing that I most depressed about Chris and my interactions with him is that we usually finish our meetings with Chris saying, I'm happy to help, or just let me know what I can do. Well, tonight, Chris, you can tell us in your own words about your academic journey and the pathway that has led to your success. I look forward to hearing from you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind introduction. I feel quite uh, overwhelmed by that. I am going to give a summary of several aspects of my career, but what I really want to be emphasising in this is that it's not really my career. What I want to talk to you about is teams. And I want to set the scene at the start of my talk by showing you a rather unusual video. Once I've shown you that, I'm going to give you a summary of the general areas that I work in. I'm going to make this unapologetically a lay summary because there's a lot of people very important to me here who are not people like many of us who think about molecular science all the time. After that, I'm going to take you on my rather eclectic journey through biology, looking at different parts, little examples of the things I've enjoyed most, ending up with some fantastic projects I'm lucky enough to be undertaking at present. I want to show you a video that's a YouTube video that my wife found and this is an American thing called pool dunking where American college students get together and they work as teams to do the most incredible things and I hope I can get this to, to play. Just, just watch this. <laughs> <laughs> 
This guy's got his leaf blower with his ball. He commits to it. And look at these guys. <laughs> so I think these guys are amazing. They've actually got a whole YouTube channel to themselves where they spend, I think, all their summers doing this. But the reason I'm showing you this is it's all about teams, isn't it? And it's a wonderful analogy for medical research. First of all, every one of these guys had their own thing to do and they did it well. You imagine the perseverance required. They must have tried that a hundred times to get it right. That's exactly what we do every day in research. There's some quiet leadership going on. There's no one obvious leader, but by searching on YouTube, the guy who really seems to be leading is actually this little guy hiding up here behind the camera. And that, that's my favoured way I think that groups should be led. So I just wanted to give you that as an example of the sort of joy I get out of research working in teams. I don't imagine myself every day doing that, but I wish we could do that as part of our project. <laughs> so to start off with my lecture, I want to give you a quick introduction in a fairly lay sense to the technologies we use. A lot of my research career has been about technology. First of all, technologies to understand molecules, function of different genes, ending up with technologies to sequence genomes and really understand how changes to genes and genomes can cause disease. Starting off at the most basic level, of course, we, we have our genes, which of course are double-stranded DNA. These genes are turned into an intermediate form called RNA, and the RNA is simply a template for which we make the proteins, and the proteins are the structural building blocks, of course, of our body. The interesting thing about this RNA is that we can measure the amount of RNA to work out how much each gene has been used. One of the things, of course, that happens in disease is that we can get mutations in these genes. Genes have some of their individual, what we call bases, their individual building blocks deleted or changed. We can also get extra copies of genes, lose whole copies of genes. Genes can be muddled up in their order. Another thing that happens in disease is we use more or less than we should of individual genes. And we often talk about that as reduced gene expression or more gene expression. So by studying the mutations in these genes or how we're using more or less of individual genes than would be normal, we can start to catalogue the real basis right deep underneath disease. So just to reiterate that, the idea of mutations causing disease where you get changes in the code of the genes leading to changes in proteins or even loss of genes or extra copies and the idea of changes in the amount of genes that are used which we can measure by the amount of this intermediate stuff called RNA. So over the last few years we've gained this magical ability to sequence our genes and sequence our DNA. And the way we do that is we take the long strands of DNA and we randomly cut them up into tiny little fragments. And these fragments we stick on a slide, rather like a microscope slide, and we use some enzymes, some proteins that can function to do stuff. And these enzymes gradually rebuild copies of the DNA. And as these copies are rebuilt, they let out a flash of light of a different colour depending on what of the different building blocks or bases is added at each time. And you end up getting a video of these different colours on a piece of glass. And by interpreting this video, you can interpret for each of these random fragments the order of the DNA bases, the order of the building blocks in the fragments. Once your sequencing machine has produced all of these random fragments, you have a situation rather like a jigsaw puzzle. You've got all these fragments and you have to then map them back to what you know of the human genome. Some of the fragments are easy, like the tree in the jigsaw puzzle would be easy to place. Other fragments are much harder to place. The blue sky, for example. Usually, we have a lot of these fragments covering every part of the genome. So we can assemble or overlay these fragments on one another. And that allows us to tolerate some errors that naturally occur during the process. I'm very indebted to several um, 
people who've kindly let me use their slides for this. So these technologies have slowly got better and better over the last 10 or so years. We have this thing in science called Moore's Law, which was developed in 1965, and it's really about the exponential increase in the number of transistors you can fit on a computer chip over time. And what is happening in this graph is that on the bottom axis, we're showing the years, on the top axis, we're showing the cost to sequence a genome. Moore's Law, or an exponential reduction in cost, would be the straight line. The costs of sequencing human genomes, though, and after the period of these technologies starting, which I've told you about, has started to decrease much more rapidly than exponential. So just a few years ago, we had these big sequencing machines like this. These would be the machines that would take all these fragments of our human DNA and read them, get the sequence. Nowadays, we've got these most fantastic things. We've got small sequences that called minions that you can hold in the palm of your hand and plug into the laptop um, USB port. Or we've got big sequences that can sequence 18,000 human genomes every year. So the first human genome that was sequenced cost about $3 billion and took about 12 to 13 years to sequence. But nowadays we could sequence one of your genomes for as little as about $3,000 US price is maybe coming down even beyond that, and we, it can be done in as little as three days, a little bit of extra time to process the data. So one of the reasons that we'd sequence genomes is to determine the inherited pattern of DNA that is different for all of us, which may predispose to disease or may modify how diseases we acquire work. We're all very similar. Our closest living relatives, the um, chimpanzees, are only different from us in about 4% of their basis. And most of us assume about 99.9% .9 identical. We're only about 1.1% difference in the individual DNA bases in our genome. We're actually even more different than that in extra copies or lack of copies of some of our genes. We're about 0.4% different in that regard. But generally, we're all very similar. So the Human Genome Project was actually finished in 2003, and this was finding the draft sequence of the human genome. It wasn't a single person, it was a set of people. And the first single person to have their DNA sequenced was really around 2007 to 2009, a whole crop of them came. Craig Venter, a genomics entrepreneur, was the first. The very um, famous Jim Watson, who co-discovered the structure of the DNA was the second, and a Korean scientist, Song Jun Kim, was the third. And one of my favorite statistics was that actually the Korean scientist was much closer in their DNA sequence to the two Euro European counterparts, European collaborators, than the two Europeans were to one another. And that's a wonderful demonstration of the very blurred boundaries of ethnicity and race, isn't it? So we don't know how many people have had their genome sequenced, but we think about up to 300,000 people have had some level of sequencing done to their genome. And the commentators in the field estimate that there'll be a doubling about every 12 months of the number of people who've had their genome sequenced. So people like me who love this type of data and this type of work face a real tsunami of data, which we're very frightened of. We are not going to cope. So information about DNA and about genomes, about how much each gene is used, is massive in size. But this is just data. It really doesn't mean very much. And on its own, it has little value until we distill information out of it. And that's what the field I work in, bioinformatics, is. My field gets information out of big pieces of data. And there's a number of bioinformaticians in the room who, unlike me, are properly trained bioinformaticians who've actually done degrees in bioinformatics. I've come to this late. I'm an amateur. And I'm always in debt for their advice. So I told you how big the data is that we tend to be looking at. It's very hard to make sense of that just by 
looking at the raw data. We have to organise it in some way. And a lot of that organisation involves mathematics, which was one of my favourite subjects at school, and I'm delighted to be able to come back to it as I get older. We often build mathematical models to distill information from genomic data. This is a wonderful scientific paper that's quite accessible to non-scientists called Can a Biologist Fix a Radio? by Yuri Lazebnik, who at that point was a postdoctoral fellow at the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories uh, northeast of New York. And what he was saying in this paper that was published in the eminent journal Cancer Cell is that scientists need to beware because the systems that they're analyzing, the sort of data they're going to get from their systems, is going to very quickly get so complex that they're going to need formal models to understand it. And we certainly have come to that point today. A lot of people hear the word model and they think of something very flaky, an imaginary representation of what's going on in an experiment. And if that's what you think, I completely agree with you. I spend a lot of my time reviewing papers where I'm trying to politely say that there really isn't enough evidence for the model people present being meaningful. In some of the first year bioinformatics teaching that I used to do, I used to give students some randomly muddled up data where I'd take the gene names and I'd randomly reassign them to different genes. And then I'd ask the students to go away and use various software packages that identify different molecular pathways that may be going on or inactivated in the data. And most of the students would come back with these fantastic findings that would be very meaningful. And at the end of the lesson I'd tell them that this was random data. One of the most difficult parts of this field of bioinformatics is controlling for what we call false discovery. Controlling for when there is apparently something real, but it's there by chance. That is the core thing we do. Here's a lovely quote from a systems biologist, Samuel Carlin. The purpose of these mathematical models is not to fit the data, it's to sharpen the biological question. So a lot of what we do as bioinformaticians when we distill information from data is we generate sharp questions that can then be taken forward in a laboratory or an animal model or by clinical trials. And what I really enjoy about what I do is that I collaborate with people in my research group who go into the laboratory and they test the hypotheses that come out of their data. We often think of that what we know about how cells and tissues function, where different genes encode proteins that operate in networks or cascades to achieve a function. And we often call these molecular pathways. And if we put lots of molecular pathways and different sorts of data together, that's the science of systems biology, really trying to build models of a cell. By using these molecular pathways, we can come to sharp hypotheses that can, we can then go back and test in a lab. So one of the key points of all this is that we're studying this big data and genomes and how genes are used because lots of minute alterations to the DNA and how much each, D, each gene is used, the RNA, is what underlies disease, or at least perpetuates disease, or can form a kind of a marker to help us understand and classify and choose better treatment for disease. This is a photo of Leroy Hood, who's a friend of the University of Auckland. He came and gave some talks here with the Bioinformatics Institute a couple of years ago. He's been involved in the School of Biological Sciences previously. But in his real life, he actually developed many of the gene sequencing technologies that we use today. And a quote from Lee Hood is that medicine is going to become an information science. In 10 years or so, we will have billions of data points for each individual. And this was in uh, 2010. Like many quotes from eminent people, maybe it's a wee bit ambitious, but I'm not sure. Let, let's wait and see. Deborah Wright and... Um, Aaron, Mary and, and Rob McNeil and I collaborated in 2011 to do a survey of many of New Zealand's cancer specialists and the overwhelming response, over 90%, was that the frequency of use of what they call decision support tools, helping decisions based on data and of molecular tests in cancer would increase in 10 years. 
and the influence on clinical decisions would increase. And this is great, and it's great excitement around the field about this, but this survey result still worries me a wee bit because we're not doing nearly enough work to determine whether really what we can do with these mathematical models and with all this gene sequencing can change the outcome for patients. And obviously that is the core. It's no good imagining we've got a really good test or a really good way to make better clinical decisions when it makes things worse or when we haven't really trialled it, of course. But with all these cautions in mind, there are some massive studies around the world using the technologies I've told you about. Some of these studies are really interesting because they don't focus on disease. They focus on the concept of wellness. How are those of us who get to age 40 or 50 without major diseases different from those of us who suffer major diseases at a young age, for example? Here's, an, here's a couple of examples of these. Professor Leroy Hood, who I mentioned on the previous slide, in his Systems Biology Institute in Seattle has huge projects where he's sequencing the genomes of up to 100,000 people and having them record a lot of information about their daily lives to try and determine the interactions between genomes and what goes on in your life, infections, how much physical activity you do, how much stress you have, what is your nutrition and so on. Another example, the research arm of Google, Google X, is collaborating with a variety of US universities to do a very similar study. There's a massive program in England, Genomics England, sorry this hasn't uh, projected very well, which is a company set up by the UK Department of Health to investigate the use of genomics to start to better direct treatment in England. In the field of cancer, of course, our area of research here, cancer is fundamentally a disease which is either driven by or is accompanied by changes to the use of genes or mutations to genes. There's a massive project called the Cancer Genome Atlas which is recently finished where around the world over 11,000 patients with um, over 33 different cancer types had their tumours that they kindly donated to the study analysed in a whole range of different ways. So the technologies are amazing, we can do incredible things, big investment around the world in these technologies, but we are still limited by a very simple thing, and that is our relative lack of understanding of how diseases work. We haven't solved diseases. Each year there's dramatic changes in our understanding of disease and normal function, but we have a massive way to go before we can utilise all of the genomic data we can produce to do really useful things. Another aspect of this that I personally feel very conscious about and keeps me awake at night sometimes, to be honest, is the responsibility. When patients donate tissues for research especially, we have a massive responsibility to do that well, and it would be so easy for things to slip. One of the most interesting engagements I've personally had as part of my research journey over the last few years has been in talking increasingly to Māori leaders in research. Often I've found that some of the principles of tikanga Māori in research, especially research around tissue and genomics, seem eminently sensible to me to apply to myself and to apply to the whole population. We have a massive amount to learn from these principles. One of the principles that I think we're thinking about more and more is, is our DNA actually ours to sequence? Or does it partly belong to our children and our ancestors? The idea of how exactly do we do consent? Is consent simply signing away uh, on a form saying your tissue can be used for research? Or is a consent a dynamic conversation where you expect some reciprocation back. You're giving a gift of that tissue. What do you expect back from the gift? Probably it's realistic and right to expect something back if possible, even if it's just information about how the tissue you have donated is helping others through research. So that's a brief introduction to the types of things that I love in research. I'm now going to talk about briefly about a couple of decades of uh, 
scientific adventures, only picking out real highlights. Please bear in mind as I go through this that this is all about that pool dunk video I showed before. It's all about quietly performing teams. I'm going to skim through this pretty quickly. For me, the beginning game when I was a very cool dude, age 16. <laughs> and I got fascinated and really turned on to research by an amazing teacher, Don Mackay, at my school, who persuaded me to stop my cross-country running for a little while and start to determine what would be an interesting question that I could ask as part of a science project. And the question I came up with, with a lot of help from Don, was how does urease enzymes in clover work? Oh, at that point, for some reason, I was very interested in agriculture. I was fascinated with how grasslands grow. It's a bit of an odd thing for a 16-year-old. I was amazed at the synergy between different plants in clover, ryegrass, pastures. When you apply urea fertilizer to these pastures, there is an induction of, or turning on, of the enzyme urease, which breaks down this urea fertilizer by clover. So I did a science project to try and understand that. I was really lucky and I got to go to a national science project. I met the Queen in Dunedin Museum, which was, I think it was a highlight. I don't think I quite recognised that at the time. I was lucky enough to get into medical school after that. And after a great period of medical school and a few adventures doing pre-hospital emergency care in the UK, that's me hanging underneath an RAF helicopter landing on an oil rig in the North Sea. I came back to the real world and my first real taste of proper research was with Professor Jim Shaw and Jim kindly took me on for two and a half months. I took two and a half months off before I got married and worked with Jim to research and write a review article on post splenectomy sepsis and I just loved this experience of research and I suddenly realised that I didn't really want to be in a surgical training program, I wanted to be a researcher. During my house surgeon years, I worked with Malcolm Sears and Robin Taylor in Dunedin and started to work with them while I was a respiratory house surgeon, researching the area of how often should you take inhaled beta agonist drugs in asthma. I don't know if it's fortunate or not, we used a drug called Phenoterol, which was a very active drug that may have given us results that were a little bit at odds with some of the other um, beta-2 agonist drugs that we use today. But nevertheless, we got a Lancet paper out of it, and it seemed to me that research was easy and fun. That was until I came and did a PhD. <laughs> I was very lucky because I had two fabulous supervisors, Jim Watson, who is one of the doyens of New Zealand science, a man I positively worship, Jeff Christensen, who sadly can't be here today, Jeff's just retired and he's on a trip around England, who was my wonderful primary supervisor. And I did a PhD trying to understand how different molecules turn on T cells or T lymphocytes. Many of the people, senior people here today were around the same time in the Department of Molecular Medicine where I did my PhD. I was trying to do quite a complex thing in my PhD. I isolated proteins from the surface of these T lymphocytes that I thought may be involved in turning these lymphocytes on or making them function. I made antibodies to these proteins and I did what's called screen and expression library, where the human DNA is cut up just like you would for sequencing, but the proteins are expressed or made from each of the fragments of the DNA on these big plates and they're made in viruses that themselves live in bacteria. Nylon filters on these plates were peeled off to try and identify what is the sequence of the DNA that encodes the protein that I'd isolated from the surface of the cells. And in the end, through lots of old-fashioned DNA sequencing, I was one of the last people, I think, one of the last generations to clone my own gene or dis discover a gene before other people had. And that gene turned out to be called connectin. It had nothing to do with how T lymphocytes function as far as we know, unfortunately. But it was still a useful finding and it was a wonderful journey. I then had four years in Melbourne in the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute. Extremely lucky to be supervised by Suzanne Corey, who was the Institute's director, and Jerry Adams. While I was there, I fell in love with a phenomena in biology called programmed cell death or apoptosis. You may not realise it, those of you who are not scientists, but 
our cells are very um, utilitarian in the John Stuart Mill sense of the word. Our cells will commit suicide when they're no longer required, when they're infected, when they're surplus to what's needed during development, when they're in the way of a tissue being remodeled. And this suicide process is called apoptosis. And the way apoptosis works is that the cells have this complex program of proteins called caspases. And these are enzymes, rather like the enzymes that get your washing clean, that will chew up the cell from the inside out. They'll dismantle the membranes of the cell, they'll dismantle the DNA. <coughs> and this is a video I made when I was, you know, several years ago when I was working. These are actually cells that line blood vessels called endothelial cells. And there's one there, there's another one up here. And this is a time-lapse video, spend up about 150 times of these cells dying by apoptosis. You can see them flowing, up, flowing off these little membrane-bound vesicles, these little almost like cell coffins, which then get taken away and reprocessed. It's an amazing process. When I was arrived in Melbourne, they just discovered a new gene themselves, like I had with the Connectin gene in New Zealand. They discovered a gene called BCLW, and it was a member of a family of genes that regulates this process of apoptosis. And my job was to work out how BCLW worked. I did that by using genetic modification technologies to knock out the gene in mice. So I generated mice that didn't have BCLW. I then spent the next two years trying to work out what on earth it did. That was some of the hardest two years of my life because the mice obviously didn't have anything at all wrong with them. But I, I learned a massive amount of pathology and histology working in path labs, going through tish, tissue after tissue, trying to see what was wrong, until suddenly I realised that these mice wouldn't breed. When we looked in the epididymis of these mice, where sperm is stored after it's been made in the testis, in normal mice you can see all these little sperm heads, and in these mice the tubules of the epididymis were completely empty of sperm. The mice were azoospermic. We then went back and we found out that the reason for this is that there was suicide of the t developing sperm cells in the testes of these mice. This was pretty much all that was wrong with these mice, but that was a fantastic finding, because it then let me work with Kate Loveland and um, David de Kretzer, who later became Premier of Victoria in Australia, to understand how the entire process of apoptosis in the BCL2 family contribute to the development of sperm, and that was a fantastic period for me. One of the amazing things was when you use special stains to identify cells that are committing suicide in the testis. You see these balls of cells. These are called symplasts. And what it turns out they are is that they're balls of cells that divided from a single parental cell and they're linked together. What happens, we found in the testis, is unlike normal division of cells as tissues grow, the cells don't divide and separate off. They remain linked together by these little cytoplasmic bridges. So these symplasts were all dying en masse. So a wonderful period of time in Melbourne. Following that I went to Cambridge and I had a, another fabulous period but in a very different environment. It's, it's the most wonderful environment where you can go to lunch and sit down next to a Nobel laureate or one of your scientific heroes. When I first arrived in Cambridge I was pretty much fresh off the boat I think and I remember Sir Brian Heap, the master of St Edmund's College, ringing me up in the lab, asking if I'd like to go and take sherry with him. And I, I was rather taken aback by the call, I hadn't met Sir Brian before, and I called him mate. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think he's ever forgotten that, I think I said, that would be great mate. Um, but luckily he, uh, he forgave me and he was a wonderful, relaxed Christian gentleman who was also one of the preeminent researchers who did a lot of research into reproductive biology in what's now known as the Babram Institute in Cambridge. When I was there, I chose to work with the man who named this process of apoptosis or cell death, Andrew Wiley, a pathologist. Steve Smith, who's a, now a great friend and collaborator, and Steve Sharnock-Jones. Steve Smith's now Dean of the Medical School in Melbourne, and Steve Sharnock-Jones is a Professor of Reproductive Biology in Cambridge now. I wanted to determine whether this process of apoptosis was important as blood vessels develop in embryos. Once again, I used genetic modification. I made some 
zygotes or the earliest cells, or blastocysts I should say, some of the earliest cells of mice that lacked a ability to die by apoptosis. When I did that, the mice never got to birth. They'd be stillborn. And when I looked very carefully, the mice had all these balls of extra cells and all these extra blood vessels that should have been removed during development, but were not removed. A lot of this work was done by a fabulous postdoc called Hélène Duval from France. The other really exciting thing though is that when we looked at the development of tissues, look at this mouse here, it's got webbed feet. Normally the process of apoptosis is required to remove the bridges between our fingers. This didn't happen. The blood vessels seemed to need to regress in order for the whole tissues to regress during development. So that led to asking the question, we know about all the proteins involved in apoptosis, and we know that this apoptosis of these blood vessel cells, endothelial cells, is important. But is DNA and changes to how genes are expressed also important for apoptosis? So what we did was we took some of these blood vessel lining cells called endothelial cells, and in the laboratory we grew them in incubators, and we caused them to die by apoptosis by tricking them into committing suicide. Then we followed the usage or expression of all the genes in the genome across time. And we saw various patterns of change of these genes. And when we looked very carefully, we realised that actually this apoptosis program is driven by, or at least assisted by, changes in a whole range of different genes. There are even induction de novo from no expression to strong expression of signals that bring in cells that will eat up the little membrane bound blebs that I showed you in that video when cells commit suicide. That's like someone phoning the undertaker to take their body away before they commit suicide. There are a multitude of other changes. The cells change the gene expression to go out of the cell cycle. They stop dividing. They change the gene expression to reduce any energy expensive process. So all the energy can be used to commit suicide. Based on that work, we realised that there was a real commercial opportunity to use the sort of genetic analysis technology to help drug companies fail their drugs early. And that seems like a bit of a funny idea, failing drugs early, but of course a lot of expense from drug companies is generated as drugs get so far down the pipeline and then do not get carried forward. So we set up a company, a group of seven other people with me, just one part of a very big team called GNI or G Networks International. And we had some fantastic luck with this company, but also a huge learning curve, and eventually this company succeeded. Came back to Auckland in 2005 with my family after precisely 10 years, almost to the day, overseas. And I was lucky to be able to, over the years, work with an amazing set of people here. And many of you can see photos that you probably think are awful photos, and I'm sorry about that. It was the best I could get from the web. This is a photo of one of our group retreats a couple of years ago at Alberton. One of the things that we've been doing in Auckland is building tools. And you probably think, well, building tools, that's engineering, that's not really science. And I agree, it is engineering. But I see a very important and core role of people doing bioinformatics, building mathematical and statistical com computational tools to better understand big data, or to better distill information from masses of data that are generated from genomics. Here's one example of a tool for gene network inference, for understanding how different genes and their correlations or interactions can tell us a little bit about the relationship between signaling molecules and cells. And this was uh, published in nucleic acids research a couple of years ago. And the, the team involved Daniel Hurley and Edmund Crampin as the core drivers of it. Another example is a project that involved Anita Mothacarapan, Andrew Schelling, and Daniel Hurley to understand how genes and the proteins they encode can relate to one another in breast cancer. And further work on this project from Annette Lasham, who is one of the main principal investigators within our broader collaborative group, found that as part of these gene networks, there was one gene that was related or linked to large numbers of other genes that all did the same thing. 
This was a gene called YB1, and it was linked to large numbers of other genes that had their expression turned on by a particular transcription factor called E2F1. Annette and Anthony Braithwaite and a large number of other people worked together to find how this particular YB1 protein seems to act as a cofactor for these E2F transcription factors. And as part of that, we also discovered that often this YB1 protein is expressed at very high levels in the same tumours that have expression at very high levels of a number of other genes in the same chromosomal location. And I was dumb enough to take ages to work this out. What was going on is that there is a region of the chromosome in which this YB1 gene sits that is amplified in a proportion of breast tumours. And by being amplified, I mean there's just lots of extra copies of this chromosomal region. And this is why all of these genes seem to be linked together, because when there's extra copies, the genes are used more, and there's more of the gene, more of the protein, all together. And Abby Jeb in our laboratory is now trying to work out what are the mechanisms for the amplification of this gene. We found that this gene is amplified in a whole range of different tumours as well as breast cancer. And as a wonderful follow-on from this project, Ming Wei Wang in China is working with Anthony Braithwaite, Peter Shepard, Annette, Alex Trevartan to try and develop, try and identify drug compounds that could be used to drug this very important oncogene in cancer. A lot of this molecular pathway research has involved Sonali Mehta and um, Deborah Wright. I'm not going to really talk about their molecular pathway research, which was very significant. I want to talk about something that I think is a bigger story from them. One of the things that we found as we work through using bank, tissue bank tissues, these are tissues that have been donated kindly from patients for research, and we can take these tissues out of a tissue bank with ethical approval and use them to understand the genetic relationships between the tissues and the disease. We, we go to no end of trouble to get all the molecular data right, but we found all the clinical data stored in the tissue banks associated with them was very dodgy. And we, we realised that that's now a major problem. Certainly in breast cancer and colon cancer, we're very lucky that we have researchers that like Lance Miller and Mick Black and John McCall who have worked very hard to get great clinical annotation and clinical information as a context against which we can interpret molecular information. But through a lot of tissue around the world that's used in research, there is very poor quality clinical information which severely limits gaining information or insights about the linkages between genes and disease. I mentioned to you before this idea of understanding molecular pathways and how different proteins work in signalling pathways and the genes that encode those proteins work together. One of the tools, we produced an engineering project from Christoph Knapp, and this is how his photo appears on the web, it's not a, a sprint, he's a very modest guy. Christoph's actually a pastry chef by training who is bright enough to also be a bioinformatician. Mitsu Araki, a postdoctoral fellow from Japan, generated with Christoph a tool called GeneSetDB to try and analyse these molecular pathways. Aaron Mary, McBlack, and um, a fabulous statistician in the group, Nick Knowlton, are now developing much better statistical methods to understand how information about molecular pathways can be extracted from genomic data. Using one of these methods, we've worked with Nancy Jenkins and Neil Copeland in the Methodist Medical Center in Houston. We were very lucky to be invited into the project, Dr. Mick Black from Otago and I, working with Michael Mann, and luckily this year we managed to, with them, get a Nature Genetics paper using some of the pathway analysis methods to understand how different genes synergize in the development of melanoma. And as part of that project, Alex Trevartan here again worked with a local company that visualize, develops visualization software for genetics called Biomatters. And Alex has worked with Biomatters to develop a wonderful tool where we've analyzed over 300 exome or genome sequences from patients with melanoma to try and determine what are the clusters or characteristics of the patients and how could potential drugs that are 
used for other purposes, perhaps be used to inhibit molecular pathways in melanoma. Another example is work on the estrogen receptor, and this again involves an etomorphocarapan, but also one of my, a person that I see as almost a role model and mentor, Dr. Andrew Schelling, who I'm incredibly fortunate to work with. And they, they say the cream always percolates to the top of the milk fat, and uh, Andrew has certainly percolated to the top, being our Associate Dean Research. Andrew is a fabulous uh, balancing influence on me. He brings me down to earth with my bioinformatic ideas, and one of the things that Andrew has worked with us to do is to help us apply these ideas to understanding how we look at molecular pathways induced by estrogen in breast cancer. A proportion of patients with breast cancer have their tumour cells addicted to estrogen. Estrogen is required for these tumour cells to grow. So there are drugs that can be used to target the tumour cells of these patients, tamoxifen and aromatase inhibitors. And what we've done is analysed the molecular pathways through a lot of hard work from Anita and a lot of insight from Andrew to identify sets of genes that can better predict which patients, we hope, better predict which patients may potentially respond to these drugs or at least to better understand the molecular pathways that underlie this form of cancer. We've also used this sort of method with Lei Ming Ching, Kimi Henare and Li Wang to look at the complex interaction in tumours between the cells of the tumour and normal cells. But I wanted to end up on what I see is right now my most exciting project I've ever been involved in. Very lucky to be working with Kate Parker, Mike Finlay and especially Ben Lawrence in a project that's a multimodal project to really target one type of human cancer at great depth. This is a sort of cancer called neuroendocrine neoplasia. And Ben and others have developed methods for um, developing multidisciplinary meetings across the country where clinicians can share their growing knowledge. And we hope to contribute to that knowledge by understanding the genomics that would underlie these tumours. Kate Parker has worked with people around the country to develop a register of these patients. And we're developing our own ethically approved tissue bank where patients have kindly donated tissue to this research. We're doing genomic analysis of these tissues and working with pathologists to try and see how the genomes and the pathology work with the clinical information about these tissues to better understand the disease and hopefully to start to stratify therapies for these patients. This is a slide I borrowed from Ben Lawrence. It's really about the project trying to move from the current type of drug trial or evaluation where a gold standard current way of treating is compared to adding on an extra way of treating to a much more multimodal way, modal way to direct therapy where you identify a genomic event. You identify whether there are corroborating events to reduce the chance of false discovery and is there a drug that could target that event. Very quickly, one example of a patient with a large neuroendocrine tumour. This is the pathology of the tumour. We've been able to do whole genome sequencing and targeted genome sequencing where Sandra Fitzgerald, Cherie Blancon, Paula Shields and several others in the group have developed ways of getting very deep sequence from both the tumours and the metastases. This is normal tissue from a patient. This is the primary tumour where the tumour started. And these are two metastases or parts of the tumour that have moved out from the tumour. And this is identifying new mutations in an important cancer gene called ATRX in the metastases of the tumour that weren't there in the primary tumour. The idea of looking for what's called aneuploidy or extra copies of chromosomes or parts of chromosomes. This is work that's being done by Sonali Mater and Thames and Rob to try and see why these tumours have so many extra copies or losses of copies of chromosomes. We're also interested in the immune system and that seems to play a role in a proportion of these cancers. There are small lymph node-like structures and there are lymphocytes that come into these tumours and when we look at how the RNA or the genes are expressed in these tumours, we see lots of genes expressed from lymphocytes and presumably from the tumour cells themselves that bring the lymphocytes in. We've been able to look at special types of molecules called microRNAs that are regulatory RNAs and at processes called methylation where genes are turned on or off by adding 
methyl residues to the start of the gene. And by using those processes, this is an example in one patient, we've been able to identify a loss of an OS switch, so the OFF switch is lost for a very important gene called mTOR. And this raises the possibility, could this patient be treated with an drug inhibitors of mTOR, such as Everolimus, because the level of this mTOR expression is higher in this patient. And we hope that one day we will be able to look at large numbers of these neuroendocrine tumours as well as other tumour types, maybe even playing chess with the tumours to identify how resistance to drugs develops by using genomics. Many other people in the Auckland Medical School and around the world, of course, are doing this type of research, but we have a real critical mass here now with um, investigators such as Stefan Bollander, who gave an inaugural lecture earlier this year. So I just wanted to end up in the last five minutes to comment on why New Zealand remains a great place to do research. We're always struggling for funding, we're always struggling for space and for good students, and often it's easy to feel that all you ever hear is negativity. But I've worked in several places, Japan, Australia, little times in the US and little times in Poland and in Britain, and I've never found a place with a more collaborative research culture that I enjoy doing research in more than New Zealand. Here's a few reasons for that. First of all, we have the Bioinformatics Institute, which I think is the most fabulous thing for a university to have. We have people um, like Kelly sitting up here in the audience who is a PhD scientist who is spending her time managing the Bioinformatics Institute. We have a whole range of skilled bioinformaticians. These people are going to be the future of this whole science of genomics I'm talking about. The marketing people talk about the global market for genomics being $22 billion by the year 2020, a 10% growth each year. They say the fastest growing place for genomics and bioinformatics will be the Asia Pacific region. And the fastest growing sector will be this personalised medicine, so they claim. Bioinformatics, or taking the genomic data and distilling information out of it, is also interesting. Here's a wonderful quote. Today's bioinformaticists, or bioinformaticians, are in for a real treat. With seemingly endless stream of biological data being generated across sectors is a high demand for talented, experienced professionals. This is difficult though, because these people right now don't really have a career path. Often they're thought of as technical engineers who are incredibly skilled at data analysis, but they're not research scientists. But a number of the people who work in our Bioinformatics Institute really understand the biology. They've done degrees in the biology. They can cross the fields from experimental science to analysing the data. They're the people that are going to be most valuable. It's wonderful when the journal Nature has a headline, Reward Bioinformaticians. You really know that the field is starting to arrive. In New Zealand, to do bioinformatics and genomics, the New Zealand government gave a large donation of over $40 million to set up and use bioinformatics infrastructure called New Zealand Genomics Limited. This had to work in a slightly clunky administrative way due to the way it was set up, but nevertheless it has conducted hundreds of research projects which have been very effective and I do hope this continues. We have groups like the New Zealand Society for Oncology where Ben Lawrence is going to take over as chair next year and do great things with it. This is a fantastic society that was generated almost 50 years ago to allow collaboration between clinicians in the cancer field and cancer scientists. We have our Queenstown meetings and a person I'm so proud to be associated and work with, Peter Shepherd. Peter drives these annual meetings that bring together many of New Zealand's molecular scientists in one place. They're growing year after year. National Science Challenges. We have a National Science Challenge 3 that I'm on the science leadership team along with several other people in this faculty. And one part of that challenge is going to be sequencing the blood of colon cancer and melanoma patients to try and develop ways to detect mutations from tumours early. And we've already done a little bit of work from Cherie Blinkion and um, Sandra Fitzgerald and Annette Lasham and several others including Sonali Mater in my group. We have the Maurice Wilkins Centre, a national collaborative where I'm a PI and where a number of people in this faculty are principal investigators, which is an incredibly powerful group to drive translational research. We also have New Zealand's strong focus on ethics and on understanding 
how patient participation is important in research. Perry Guilford, a collaborator of mine, is probably our poster boy in that. Perry has done the most incredible things working closely with Māori to identify mutations in cadherin genes that can predispose to cancer. So we often talk in New Zealand about the idea of translational bridges. Translating our findings from the research I've been talking about into the clinic. And if you look at a development in Melbourne that's a real aspiration for mine, the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre. Over here on the right is the Royal Melbourne Hospital and the Walton Liza Hall Institute where I spent four years. And this is a new building that's going up and it's actually got, I think, two bridges across to the hospital and the research place. Now we don't have a translational bridge, we've got a tunnel. <laughs> but despite that, we have one thing that the tunnel demonstrates very well and that is innovation. The tunnel leaks terribly. It's got all the underwater heating pipes going through. And this is a real example of number eight wire keyway ingenuity of which I'm so proud to be a New Zealander. Here, here is a leaking pipe, a rubbish bin under it to catch the big leaks, but we've got a funnel and a hose that runs down to a drain. But putting it seriously, that's the sort of Kiwi innovation that I think we do incredibly well. That is why we punch above our weight. The fact that we've got a tunnel doesn't matter one iota. We also have a very um, well-supported academic alliance in Auckland. And this is the sort of thing that makes me want to really stay in Auckland and do research. This is largely driven by John Fraser and Megan Puttrell. It's got a future of an integrated cancer centre. We have a lot of future genomic initiatives in this. And as part of this, and as a centre of this, we have an Auckland Regional Tissue Bank where patients can give under ethical approval tissues for research. We have a training scheme now where registrars every year medical registrars or path registrars can come across from the hospital and engage in research. And the current person is Nicole Kramer, a pathologist who's working with my research group with Ben Lawrence. This is Brian McMath, who is chair of the Newmarket Rotary Trust, who has very kindly been funding these. So I have had an incredibly exciting journey from a nerdy 16-year-old investigating clover ryegrass pastures to being privileged to work with some amazing people and have enough funding to analyse genomes with the hope that one day I can be part of this tripartite treatment of patients, the traditional medical acumen, the traditional pathology and the genomics. Certainly it's really exciting times when you can hold a sequencing machine in your hand. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure to be able to thank Chris tonight for your wonderful inaugural lecture. Um, I'm Cathy Crozier and I'm representing the Department of Molecular Medicine and Pathology. Our head of department, Peter Browett, unfortunately couldn't be here um, this evening. He's terribly disappointed to be missing it and um, you know, wanted to convey his best wishes and congratulations to you. These are such great events. It's lovely to see Adele and the family here and to learn of the variety of experiences that you've had that have um, shaped the current work that you're doing in the university. Well, I first heard of Chris when I was actually returning to the university from a period overseas and I remember Jim Watson telling me that he was very excited about this um, PhD student that was about to start. And so I've really followed um, Chris's career with a lot of interest over the years as he's passed through the Hall Institute and, and in Cambridge. And we were just so delighted when we learnt that you were interested in, in coming back to Auckland, which is now sort of about 10 years ago. Um, and I've really enjoyed working with Chris in both teaching and research. I mean, I think many in the audience um, would agree with me um, that Chris is incredibly positive, giving, friendly, um, and hard-working colleague. Uh, and um, I'd like to note that that actually translates into a culture, I think, that permeates your lab. And I think all the individuals in your lab are just so great, the way they so cheerfully want to engage when we want them to help with something in the department or with, or with teaching. Um, I think you've provided great support for the reinvigorated uh, medical program, particularly being a champion of the clinical scenarios and fostering research opportunities uh, for our students. 
and you've always got time for the students, you know, and teaching the pathology and the genetics, and I know they respect you highly for that. So I'm a haematologist, and this morning I actually spent time with a patient and his wife who's just been diagnosed with acute leukaemia. And one of the important parts of our discussion this morning was actually that with the bone marrow that he had taken this morning, that the molecular genetic tests that we do on that marrow are going to shape our decisions about what sort of treatment he's going to have. And so I just really thought that was a very good example of how the things that Chris has talked about aren't just prospects for the future. I mean, a number of areas, they are now the reality for us as clinicians and in managing um, our patients and really going to make a real difference. So Chris has um, really been at the forefront, I think, of ensuring that New Zealand's well positioned to be a part of um, capturing the opportunities of, ge of genomic analysis, um, not only for um, in the clinic, but also for really enhancing our fundamental biomedical research, which of course is also so important. So Chris, the university is very fortunate to have you in our midst and um, it's now very deservedly as a professor. So congratulations. Thank you, Cathy, for some lovely closing remarks and thank you, Paul, for the introduction. Um, before I formally draw this inaugural lecture to a close, um, I'd like to just add my comments uh, as Dean. I actually go back quite some way with Chris. We used to go running when he was a PhD student and I was a fresh postdoc in, in molecular medicine. Um, 15, 20 years on, maybe it's even more than that now, um, I can't think of anybody who's made more of a contribution to this faculty right across the continuum, not only in research but teaching and service. Chris is one of those stars that we have. Um, and I'd particularly like to remind Chris that one of the most important contributions he ever made to my career was uh, one day he walked into the lab and I had a computer on my desk and he, uh, at that stage I think we just connected it to the internet. Um, pretty newfangled thing and I knew nothing about the internet. Of course, Chris in his typical wisdom knew all about the internet and he loaded up a, a program, I can't even remember what it was called, it wasn't Netscape, it was the one before Netscape. And we, uh, he typed in a URL, URL to NASA and we watched uh, the comet Shoemaker-Levy crash into Jupiter. And it was my first experience of the World Wide Web and the internet. And of course, um, as we all know, the rest is history. But it's typical of Chris that he knew all about this before anybody else did. <laughs> and he also had the time and wisdom to stop and show me all about it. And I was awestruck by it. So, um, I think that just sort of speaks to the type of person that Chris is. So I'd like to think, uh, offer my personal congratulations. I'd also like to reiterate uh, with Cathy that we were delighted when you made the decision to return to New Zealand. And uh, um, the support you've given to people, I hope, has been returned and the support that we've provided to you. So uh, congratulations again on a wonderful seminar. And thank you all for coming. I hope it's stopped raining. Um, we'll soon find out when we leave. So, just to remind you that the next inaugural lecture is Professor Nicola Dalbeth, and that is next Tuesday. It's not Thursday, it's next Tuesday. So you'd be all very welcome to attend. So once again, thank you for coming, and thank you, Chris, for a wonderful lecture.